In this video, we will be exploring the methodological and empirical contributions of Archimoglu and Johnson's paper, The Colonial Origins of Comparative Development. This paper contributes to the divergence debates in new and unique ways. It makes an argument that is at once historical and empirical. This is why this paper has been cited thousands of times and has radically altered the way we understand the problem of long-run economic divergence between countries. To truly appreciate Achimoglu's contribution, it is imperative to take a step back and understand precisely what problem he is trying to solve in this paper. The divergence debates, if you recall, are contested by proponents of two fundamental channels, the geography hypothesis and the institutional hypothesis. Scholars such as Jared Diamond are in the former camp and argue that natural factors such as climate, disease and endowments, things that cannot be changed per se, are responsible for long-run divergence in economic outcomes. But as economists, we are interested in quantifying the problem to understand how, for example, a given climate or soil quality or an institution such as democracy affects long-run economic development. Of course, simple statistical correlations will reveal certain patterns. We see, for example, that countries with better institutions are economically more developed, countries near the equator are less developed. But which way does the causality run? Are rich countries rich because they have better institutions? Or do they have better institutions because they are rich? This is the familiar correlation does not imply causation or the endogeneity problem that you have been learning about since your first statistical course. How can we claim that our explanatory variable x, institutions in Archimoglu's case, causally influences our outcome variable y, GDP per capita today? Archimoglu tries to solve this problem using a well-known technique in econometrics known as the instrumental variable or the IV technique. The IV technique involves a simple little trick. Recall that we wanted to find a link between x and y. We wanted to know how x functionally influences y. In the presence of endogeneity, we cannot be certain which way the causality runs. But imagine a hypothetical variable z with a unique property. While it strongly correlates with our explanatory variable x, there is no theoretical reason to believe that it is directly linked to y other than its link via x. Let's try understanding this via an example. Say you wanted to understand the link between smoking, our x variable, and ill health, an outcome variable y. If we ran a simple regression, we find a statistically significant relationship. But which way does the causality run? Do smokers have bad health outcomes because they smoke, or do they smoke because they are depressed, unhealthy individuals to begin with? Now let's try solving this problem using the IV technique. We need to find a third variable z that is directly connected to x, but not to y. Pause the video and see if you can come up with such a variable to measure the link between smoking and health. Remember that we want to develop a causal link. Statisticians have used the tax rate on tobacco in different countries and states as precisely such an instrumental variable. The argument is that while the tax rate via its effects on the price of tobacco products, is linked directly to the propensity to smoke, there is no reason to believe that the tax rate may be linked directly to individual health outcomes. Thus, any effects of the state tax rate, our Z variable, on individual health outcomes Y can only occur via the effect of Z on X. In this case, the state tax rate can be used as an instrumental variable. What this means simply is that we basically replace the x in our regression with this variable z and use the results of that regression to reflect a 
causal link between x and y. Again, arguing that the only way z and y could be related is via the mediation of z on x. But as I am sure you guys have already figured, this will open a new debate. Other statisticians can argue that there could be thousands of ways that z could be either directly linked to y or not be linked at all. For example, statisticians who oppose the use of the tax rate as a good IV will argue that the states with higher tobacco tax rates are generally more liberal and hence more likely to have better health outcomes to begin with. This will be relevant for us as we return to Archimoglu's study and examine his instrumental variable. In the second assignment in this course, I will ask you guys to look at other plausible explanations for that precise link. Okay, so let's return to Archimoglu's paper. As an institutionalist, he wants to demonstrate that the fundamental channel of economic divergence is institutions. To establish a causal link between current institutions and current economic development, he needs an instrumental variable with the aforementioned desired properties. To recall, the IV should be directly connected to current institutions and only indirectly to current economic development via its effect on institutions. In Archimoglu's paper, this instrumental variable is early colonial settler mortality. His argument works in four steps. Step 1. There were, broadly speaking, Archimoglu argues, two kinds of colonialisms. Settler colonies, i.e. places where Europeans settled, versus extractive colonies, i.e. where Europeans couldn't settle. In places where Europeans could settle, they created European-styled, or what Archimoglu calls, neo-European institutions, such as in North America, Australia, New Zealand, etc. In other places, which is basically most places, they created extractive institutions. So institutions created over 200 years ago evolved into current institutions and hence, via their impact on institutional history, affect comparative economic outcomes today. Step 2. What determined the choice of whether to settle or not? Archimoglu's answer, somewhat ironically I may add, is geography. Specifically, the disease environment. Europeans, he argued, could only settle in places where they had immunity to local diseases. So, in a sense, Archimoglu confesses in the paper that sure, geography matters, but it only matters, he says, in the beginning, not anymore. Current development depends on current institutions, which he says are endogenous and hence subject to change. Step 3. If the aforementioned story is true, then we must be able to demonstrate it empirically. Archimoglu goes to archival records of physicians who accompanied early settlers and recorded the morbidity and mortality rates of these early settlers. Using these archival records, he constructs a data set with one crucial piece of information, the settler mortality rate, our instrumental variable. This is the fraction of early settlers who died in the colony. Step 4. Archimoglu runs what we call a two-stage least squares, or 2SLS for short. In the first stage, we run a regression to prove that our instrumental variable is indeed a good instrument. In Archimoglu's case, he will prove that settler mortality is a good instrument for our X institutions. In the second stage, he will use that instrument to calculate its effect on current GDP. Here's what he finds. With this econometric methodology, Archimoglu arrives at the staggering result that once the effect of institutions is controlled for, countries in Africa or closer to the equator 
do not have lower outcomes. Settler mortality rates over 200 years ago explain anywhere between 25 to 55 percent of the differences in current economic outcomes around the world. In the next video, I will be discussing ways via which other people have criticized Achimoglu's approach. For now, I want to leave you with today's questions. Number one, focus on the settler mortality rate as an instrumental variable. Can you think of ways that the settler mortality rate could be connected to current development through ways other than that what Archimoglu is suggesting? Number two, what if I told you that the settler mortality rate data that was used by Archimoglu is actually data of soldier mortality? That is, the people who died in these colonies were not civilians, but military personnel. Would that change your analysis of the paper and its interpretations? I look forward to hearing your comments in the discussion forum.